Good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us for this President's Roundtable. My name is Elizabeth Waring, and I am honored to serve on the boards of directors of the Houston Methodist Hospital System, the Houston Methodist Foundation, and is co-chair of our campaign for our second century. My husband Peter and I are so pleased to host today's program and share an exciting new initiative that is truly transformative for our hospital. Our program will be interactive and I hope you will take advantage of the opportunity to text us your questions and engage with our presenters. And now I would like Peter to tell you more about this exciting new initiative. Thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome to everyone again. You know, 47 years ago, uh, Elizabeth started her first job out of college at the Methodist Hospital so we could save enough money for me to pay my tuition to Harvard Business School. So I have a deep appreciation for this institution. But I'm not a scientist and I'm not a doctor, so my contribution today is more focused on the business side of medicine. And having run a business for the last 30 years, my specialty is making concrete girders and pilings for roads and bridges. And that doesn't have anything to do with medicine. But steel and concrete are the building blocks of our business. But you need an expensive plant that has cranes and batch plants and trucks and other equipment. And you need a great team of people, experienced team of people, to make it work. And you need to reinvest in that team of people and the plant every year to make it more efficient so you can compete in the marketplace. Well, likewise, cells are the building blocks of medicine. Yet within Houston Methodist, currently there are no facilities in-house where our scientists and researchers can manufacture and develop cell-based patient treatments. Our researchers have to outsource that manufacturing capability, which adds to higher costs because they have to go outside. It causes delays in timing because they have to wait in line sometimes to get that access to those labs. And so it just adds to the delay of bringing innovative cellular treatments from the laboratory bench to the patient's bedside. That is, until now. Because thanks to the initiative of Ann and Johnny Johnson, Houston Methodist will soon be home to a world-class, state-of-the-art, cellular therapeutic center that will benefit patients suffering from a wide variety of diseases. The Ann Kimball and John W. Johnson Center for Cellular Therapeutics will be physically located right alongside our leading doctors and researchers. So Houston Methodists will continue leading medicine by creating the best state-of-the-art manufacturing plant in the marketplace. So I'd like to turn it back to Elizabeth so you can hear more. In a few minutes, you are going to get to hear from three of our superstar physician leaders at Houston Methodist. First, it's my pleasure to introduce the man leading the entire Houston Methodist hospital system. He is the first CEO in the hospital's 101-year-old history who holds an MBA from Wharton Business School. And unlike my Peter, he is a practicing physician. Houston Methodist <laughs> President and CEO, Dr. Mark Boone. Thank you, Elizabeth and Peter. Um, thank you for your tremendous support of Houston Methodist. I, I love that story about uh, uh, you paying your way to business school uh, working at Houston Methodist. That's great. Too bad you didn't go to Wharton, though. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. So, well, I'm, I'm socially distanced in my office here, so my three colleagues could all be at the desk across the hospital. Uh, but I want to welcome each of you here today, and uh, I want to thank, uh, as I said, Elizabeth and Peter, um, thanks to people like them and many others. Um, Houston Methodist is what it is, and it's so fun now to say 101 instead of 100 years. You know, from the beginning, as we've developed our academic mission here over the last 15 years, 
our focus has been about translational research and no more has that been more evident than during this COVID pandemic where uh, our research has really been accelerated to the bedside and, and colleagues of, of mine across the institution have uh, been pushing therapies to help patients. And uh, that is our goal really across everything that it is we do. In addition, our goal is to be the absolute safest hospital anywhere on the planet. And I think we do a darn good job, but that's one of those journeys that you never will reach the destination can never be too safe, we'll always be building. Um, and one of the beauties of building the cell research and, and cell therapy uh, uh, center uh, is for our scientists really not to have to go out of house, to have, to have the consistency and the quality and the safety and the excellence that we are used to here at Houston Methodist. Now we have this wonderful vision and vision is one thing, but oftentimes the fuel that makes uh, a vision move forward is really the philanthropy. And I'm so delighted to introduce two visionaries who have really helped us dream big and who have provided this wonderful support for Houston Methodist. And that of course is Anne and Johnny Johnson. Johnny is the chair of our Houston Methodist Foundation Board of Directors. And it is our tremendous privilege to name our new cellular therapeutic center in honor of Anne and Johnny. So Johnny, would love to hear from you and hear a little bit about what has inspired you and Anne to make it possible for us to establish this new Johnson Center for cellular therapeutics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boom. Uh, in November of 2018, at a meeting of the Houston Methodist Hospital Foundation Board, Drs. Dirk Sossman and Stanley Appel gave very informative reports. Dr. Appel's subject was titled, A Neurological Restoration Initiative Utilizing Cell-Based Therapy. For most of us in the room, not only was this uncharted waters, but the fact that it had the potential to unlock some of the mysteries of Alzheimer's, stroke, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, ALS, and even the transplantation of organs was intriguing. He identified the cell therapy lab as the key priority in advancing his vision for restorative medicine in the 21st century. He said that it would free Houston Methodists from having to wait for outside labs to process our requests and that it would really speed up our research. Dr. Appel went on to say how this could be a real difference maker in developing groundbreaking new treatments and that it would actually help us recruit the best and brightest scientific, scientific superstars. Best of all, he said that this would not only benefit his work in neurological diseases, but it would also impact research and potential therapies for virtually every major disease treated in Houston Methodist. That was inspiring. Ann and I decided that we wanted to be a part of this quest. We emphasize that the focus is on the cellular therapeutics part of the name, that it will be a real game changer. We both are grateful for all that Houston Methodist does for its patients and the community. And we look forward to seeing the life-changing remedies that the physicians and scientists working in the Cellular Therapeutics Center will make available for those suffering from illness and injury, not only here, but literally everywhere. My experience has been that in successful enterprises and pursuits, it is people that make the difference. And now I'm privileged to introduce one of these extraordinary people, Dr. Stan Appel. Dr. Appel holds the Peggy and Gary Edwards Distinguished Chair in ALS and is the chair of the Stanley H. Appel Department of Neurology at Houston Methodist. He has devoted his life to understanding the brain, leading to groundbreaking treatments for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, ALS, and Parkinson's. We couldn't be more pre pleased and proud that Dr. Appel will be leading this Center for, Center for Cellular Therapeutics. Dr. Appel, please tell us more about the Center. And thank you so much. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for your philanthropy. And thank you for honoring all the physicians who have been struggling so hard to uh, initiate programs in cell therapy and for the privilege of moving forward, uh, which we're going to do in a major way. At this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Ed Jones the head of our research institute to describe the facility that I think is going to be a game changer. Ed? 
Thank you, Dr. Appel. Good morning. Thank you again, Ann and Johnny, so much for your generosity, for your vision, and also for bringing Dr. Appel and I back together. Dr. Appel had this vision many years ago and tracked me throughout the halls of this hospital for several years to the point at which I was beginning to have to avoid him <laughs> until your wonderful <laughs> gift has now rekindled our relationship. So thank you so much. <laughs> I would like to begin this morning uh, with a brief overview of the actual facility and how it plays into our strategic plan. As you may recall, the Houston Methodist Research Institute was really designed to accelerate the cycle to a cure by speeding up this transition and taking out uh, time and money out of the equation. One knows that it often takes about 17 years and more than $3 billion for a new therapy to be discovered and brought to the clinic. And the Research Institute was really designed with the purpose of accelerating this cycle. And I think as you will see, this new Center for Cell Therapy will create an anchor tenant in this schematic. So it, this is a manufacturing facility, but it'll do more than just manufacture. It will also accelerate preclinical studies. It will accelerate into clinical trials and ultimately provide new therapies for our patients. So it very much completes our cycle to a cure. The overall manufacturing process is illustrated in this schematic and this oversimplifies, but you can see we're able to take cells out of a patient. We will be able to isolate, identify, and then expand, modify, and activate different components of the cells. We'll be able to automate these into therapeutic doses. We'll be able to sample and test, store, and then get ready for distribution back into either the same patient or other patients. This schematic looks relatively simple, but I can promise this is a quite complex process that few other research-oriented facilities in the US are able to accomplish. This is an overview of the facility, and um, while I promise there won't be a test at the end of, of the uh, schematic here, I wanted to illustrate simply that this facility is a self-contained facility that will go from, again, that isolation up through the manipulation, activation, storage, and therapy all within a singular facility. Uh, it is so important to have these type of integration and not be fractured as which is the case at most of these types of facilities throughout the country. I'm pleased to announce that we are on track for an opening in early 2021. We have completed the facility design, and thank you to Dr. Boom and to our CFO, Kevin Burns, for uh, continuing to push this project forward. The facility construction is active and underway. Uh, we will begin testing the facility just after the first of the year, with a full opening expected in May of 2021. So an incredible progress. As Dr. Boom uh, mentioned, one of the key components isn't just to have the facility, it isn't just to have the facility near our scientists, but it's to have the facility on an integrated academic medical center that brings the scientists, clinicians, patients, and these types of specialized facilities all together. And here you can see where the facility will be housed. It is housed in our outpatient clinic, so it's directly connected to our clinical operations and just a short connector from our inpatient operations and from our research discovery laboratories could not be better placed uh, into a fully integrated academic medical center. And I think this is one of the real beauties of what we have tried to create here at Houston Methodist. And finally, I wanted to uh, mention two other folks because you will hear from our clinicians in a moment, but this type of facility also takes specialized operators to make this work. These are not easy to find people. We have uh, Dr. Christopher Lincoln, who oversees all of our manufacturing uh, facilities here at Houston Methodist. And I'm pleased to announce we recently had Daniel Coda join us. He joined us from Emory, where he was uh, an associate director for their cell therapeutics to come in, and he will be the director overseeing this entire cell facility. Uh, and so these facilities uh, really require the discipline uh, under FDA guidance to produce these types of therapeutics. And you can see the staff below that will be supporting this facility. And so with this, I would like to uh, turn 
this back over to Dr. Appel. And I would just like to say again, thank you for your generosity. Um, the facility is important, but I think you're gonna hear what is the real magic, and that is the innovation that these clinicians will be able to bring to our patients uh, with the prospect of hope that otherwise could not be achieved, but for a facility like this. So again, thank you so much. Ed, thank you very much. Uh, we very much appreciate getting a view of this facility. It's exciting and uh, it's trailblazing for all of us. Our uh, Ann Kimball and John Johnson Center will in fact encompass for the moment five different programs, neurology, cardiology, transplantation, cancer, and orthopedics. So with respect to cell therapy, I just want to indicate how important this is. I think Ed has given us uh, the highlight of this, but this is important for cancer and what it'll mean in cancer, for transplantation, for what it's going to mean in orthopedics, and what it's going to mean in heart disease, as well as neurology, ALS, and as well Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. I think what people may not appreciate is that we understand many of these diseases in ways that allow us to have antibodies to attack certain components. But unfortunately, for example, in our field of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's and ALS, if you attack a single parameter that we know is disturbed and could be causing difficulty, it unfortunately doesn't resolve the issue because it's not just one. For example, in COVID-19, you've heard the term cytokine storm. There are many different components that could be contributing. And the bottom line is you can't have enough of these antibodies to attack each one of the cytokines, and that's where cells become important because cells can attack all of them simultaneously, and that's the important issue. So uh, let me just briefly go through and indicate for neurology, what are we dealing with? We here depict Stephen Hawking uh, and his difficulty with respect to ALS, Muhammad Ali and his Parkinson's, as well as Ronald Reagan Alzheimer's. These are three very important diseases that are going to benefit from cell therapy. So one of the things with regard to our program in neurology is that we know that a population of neuroprotective cells called Treg, regulatory T lymphocytes, are dysfunctional. And that allows immune parameters, activated cells that are called macrophages or T cells, to be inflammatory. But what we need to do is we can expand these cells, and when we expand them in a cell therapy GMP facility, these formerly neuroprotective cells can become protective again, and in fact, can suppress the activated inflammation. And this is of great importance in all diseases that we're dealing with in neurology, especially in ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's, and as well in stroke. There are two essential ways you can do this. One is we can do it by virtue of isolating the cells from the patient, expanding them in the GMP facility. And on the left side of this, all of this is done outside the body in a GMP facility, and then we could administer these cells back again to the patient and we're currently in phase 2A of a study of this with ALS. On the right side of the figure, we know that you can also expand the cells within the patient, and we're in the midst of a phase 1 study in Alzheimer's disease that is most exciting. So we know these are game changes for ALS, for Parkinson's, for Alzheimer's, and stroke. Uh, let's now turn to uh, cell therapies for orthopedics. What is quite clear is that you can 
establish opportunities for isolating particular cells that are called mesenchymal stem cells that in fact can enhance arthritic problems, can enhance cartilage problems, and will be a game changer for orthopedics. Program in uh, heart, uh, RNA programs here at uh, Methodist will be enhanced by our cell therapy. We already have an outstanding program under the leadership of John Cook that is hospital-based RNA therapeutics. And then we have two programs that I'm just going to introduce very briefly. One is our CAR T cell program for cancer uh, that Jenny Chang will be discussing and just a mock-up of the kind of problem that this will help resolve. And the other is, of course, our transplant center that you're going to hear from uh, Osama Gaber, uh, which is critically important that it have a cell therapy program. So I'll just conclude on this and once again extend our thanks and our gratitude to Anne and John Johnson for establishing this center that is going to benefit all of our programs here at Methodist. And we will indeed be leading medicine with respect to this. So at this juncture, I'd like to now begin our program and turn it over to Dr. Jenny Chang and tell us about your cancer plans, your cancer programs for the GMP facility. Stan, I must actually truly applaud you for this vision because it truly is going to be a game changer. For cancers, you know, cell-based therapies is, um, you can actually give it a, a treatment. And uh, we can do it in several ways. There are things that are called TILs where you grind up the tumor and you take out the T cells and you inject it back into the cancer so, so that your T cells, your own immune cells can kill the cancer. But usually the cells that come out of that, they're exhausted. They don't have the oomph to fight the cancer and it's not the best way to do it. So what has happened is that we now can take out these um, white cells, these uh, immune cells, we can modify it, we can get it, let, get it to recognize certain components of the cancer, uh, inject it after we expand it, we inject it back into the patient, and some of these uh, treatments are available um, for liquid tumors. They're very expensive. I mean, I think conservatively you're talking about half a million dollars. Uh, per treatment, and uh, but it is approved, uh, and because it does lead to long-term remission and long-term cure, but that's not enough because it only affects a small type, some subsets of, of of cancer, and we want to be able to extend this to different types of cancer, um, and this is where the CAR T's, the modifying CAR T's, um, by enabling your different types of your white cells. You can not only use T cells, now you can use NK cells, you use dendritic cells. These have all different properties. Some of them have memory. Why is it important to have memory? Because it, it can hang around longer. It can realize that, you know, uh, that's not in the future, that that cancer cell isn't supposed to be there and it can go and kill it. So we can modify all the, these immune cells that you have in your system uh, to recognize the cancer and inject it back into the, your body. Um, and we have so much research going on as we are speaking, um, other than uh, we have one DOD grant that's going in for brain metastases, uh, looking at CAR T's for brain mets uh, in patients with breast cancer. We have um, other programs of multiple myeloma, um, looking at different forms of cells that you can inject back. And it's, it's a whole wealth of information that's coming out. Based on this, we actually have, we have probably four programs are ongoing in different types of cancer. Uh, we're also recruiting a top uh, transplanter. He's coming to join us next year. Uh, he's going to be leading a lot of these programs for us. Um, he's a bone marrow transplant uh, expert. Uh, and we're also recruiting this top uh, notch person from Wake Forest. Mr. Ed Jones has to approve that, and he does. He's going to come through and he's going to help modify. And he's really, ex we're really, really excited about all these people uh, joining our program. And it's, it's a really phenomenal, we, we can't do any of this without this, this facility that, you know, was your vision for such a long time. Um, we basically had to beg, borrow, steal, uh, wait in line, and um, maybe with lots and lots of begging, maybe get the cells made. But now we can actually direct uh, these programs that we, we think uh, will attract the best clinicians, scientists, put it together, 
uh, to hopefully effect more cures. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. That's fabulous. And now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Gaber. Osama, tell us what your program is like and what your plans are. Well, I, I want to say that um, just sitting here and getting energized by these two colleagues is just amazing, the passion by which they both spoke about the prospect of this great new facility in terms of advancing the research is really engaging. And I want to thank the Johnsons for the vision to really support us so that we can do this. It's, it's amazing for us. In transplantation, we talk about having one organ for life. And the idea in transplantation is that hopefully we will prevent people from getting into organ failure. Cell therapy is really important into that because as you heard from both Dr. Chang and Dr. Appel, cell therapy affects the immune system and a lot of the diseases that lead to organ failure are immunological diseases in which the organ is attacked by its own owner, the host, the cells of the body. So there is a whole lot of therapies that we can actually use to modify the immune response inside the body. We then take the organs out to transplant them. Uh, we take them from donors, whether cadaver donors or living donors, and now we have to store them, we have to process them, then we have to put them back. And this is an amazing opportunity because as the organ is outside of the body, you can now put in it any type of cell that you want so that the organ will have a completely different behavior when it gets transplanted. And without any systemic toxicity, you can try things without worrying about the patient because the organ is outside of the body. So that's an amazing potential in transplantation. And finally, once we put the organs in, we want to actually prevent them from having rejection and getting lost uh, after transplantation. Our approach is very simple. First, we're going to try to understand the etiology of organ failure. We're going to try to use cellular therapeutics to treat that. We're going to then use it to modify organs. And finally, we're going to use it to make new organs so that we can put into patients new organs. And I think, based on the fact that we have this therapeutics, we're now starting the new Center for Transplant Regeneration. And I, I want to thank Stan for really spearheading this because without his relentless effort as described by Mr. Jones, we would have not been here. So thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you again to the Johnsons. What a great gift. Thank you, Osama. Uh, well, I want to thank you both because uh, uh, as Ed Jones was telling us, I used to beat on him, but then <laughs> I'd confide in Jenny and Osama saying, hey, we need to band together, yep. and maybe all of us can go talk with Ed Jones and with Mark Boone, because what is clear is we needed this facility, and now we have it. So I think there are a number of questions that uh, have come up, uh, and the first question is, how much more affordable will these be for HM patients via the HM lab versus an outside lab. Uh, let me just tell you, I can give you a brief start and maybe Jenny and Osama can, can add to that. I will tell you, uh, GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Production. Good Manufacturing Production. It's required by the FDA that we have a facility that in fact is clean, uh, passes quality control, uh, does not have any toxins associated with the isolation and growing of cells, nor any infectious agents. And this is something that the FDA is quite concerned about and we're all quite concerned about because there are many such places in the country, and I'll call them places, I won't use the term fraudulent, because I shouldn't use that term, but in fact, we need the best that the FDA has to offer. We need the opportunity to make sure we've got an outstanding GMP facility, and we'll have this with the Johnson Cell Therapy Program. Now, the, the question is, is it going to be cheaper than what we've been using. All of us have uh, used other facilities in the medical center, 
And I can tell you the answer is a resounding yes from our experience in neurology. Jenny, does that look like it's, oh. it's reasonable from your point of view as well? So we're putting in a DOD grant because the facility is not up and running yet. We have to contract out. And trust me, the lion's share in, goes into manufacturing. You're talking about just for 10 patients, we have to pay an outside GMP facility close to half a million dollars. It's, it's just prohibitive if you want to do um, any sort of meaningful uh, translational cell-based therapies. It's, it's just not not. Possible. Osama, what, what's your experience? My experience this? is that we probably would save about maybe 50 to 60 percent of yeah, the cost. Yeah. But more importantly, I want to just say that it's not just about cost, it's the ability to control the yeah, manufacturing modify. process and, and, and yeah. des design the cells. When you contract out, you're getting what the other lab gives you. But when you have it here, you go to Chris and you say, these cells don't look exactly right. What can we do to fix that? And then you have a product that's actually clinically superior and benefit the patients more. I think that's the, the, an amazing benefit for us. No, I, I agree totally. Uh, the next question uh, I'm going to ask each of you to answer, what's the most exciting cell project you're working on, Dr. Chang? For, oh, I'm a breast cancer doctor, so obviously I have to. But it's not that though. But all forms of liquid, uh, all forms of cancer, whether it's liquid or solid, because at the moment the treatments are not available for solid tumors. The most common types of cancers: lung, breast, prostate. We don't have cell-based therapies for those. If we can find a way in which we can actually get your immune system modified and put it back to you with the cellular therapeutics, to me that is the most exciting. I think we can. Uh, we're not there yet for the liquid tumors. We have commercially available um, 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 uh, cell-based therapeutics, but for the solid tumors, not yet, but we're going to get there. Osama, what's your answer to that? Well, I have a lot of exciting things in transplantations, you know, but w one of the most exciting things, I just saw a patient that's a year and a half out from an experiment where we gave some donor cells, sort of a modified type of stem cells, and, and that patient has been off of any immune suppression medications well, for wow. a year and a half, mm -hmm. taking zero medicine. When I saw him, I, I mean, my, I just, it was, it was an amazing moment because you can do transplantation without immune suppression. Mm. This is gonna help us find out. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna be biased and tell you about ours as well. Uh, <laughs> I have two. One is ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Definitely. We're in a phase 2A study and I will tell you that we have learned so much and in our study it is quite clear now that in a large number of patients we can make a difference. We can stop progression and we're excited about this. Is it in all? I wish it was in all. But most importantly what is intriguing is that we know how to change what we're doing so that we can improve that. And the other, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, we have some of the most exciting work in Alzheimer's disease where within vivo modulation of the immune system, we not only in a small study have stopped progression, we in fact have enhanced clinical performance. And if we can in fact document this in a larger study, uh, it is a real game changer. So thank you for that question. Uh, the next is, uh, how long will it be before patients start benefiting from cell therapies made in the Johnson lab? A year, two, more? Jenny, what are your thoughts? I'm thinking what we need to do is, for cancer it's slightly easier because we have available um, um, therapeutics. And we can get actually contracts from pharma, pharmaceutical companies that are um, actually uh, formulating some of these and we can definitely run them through the GMP facility, um, f offset some of the costs so that we can actually use the philanthropy dollars that the Johnsons and others have given to actually make new therapies that we want to do so we can kind of balance the books a bit. But the minute Johnson Center is open we can start actually for us for cancer we can start immediately. Great. Osama, what well, it, it takes some time for us because um, most of what we're doing needs FDA approval and most of our approvals now are based on the manufacturing facilities that we're using. So transferring that may take a few months. But my suspicion is within a year we'll be doing our own and, 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 and fully active and running. And as Jenny said, 
we're not now, now because the difference in the cost and the quality, you're not going to restrict ourselves to what we've done in the past. Now the sky is the limit. We can actually do more and do better. Fabulous. And I will tell you for our ALS, Parkinson, and Alzheimer's program, I mean, we're ready to go. We're absolutely ready to go, and, and we'd love to take off in this new facility as soon as it opens. Uh, next question. Will the Johnson lab only be for HM patients, or will the lab also do work for other outside projects? In your field, Jenny? I, I think we was limited to HM investigators and patients at this moment because it's not that big and we have so much pent up need in the future. If it gets bigger, sure, but I, I think there's so much that we need to do in house at the moment. I can't see it being big enough yet to take outside contracts, but I could be wrong. Okay. Osama, what are, you, what are your thoughts? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, what, what Jenny says is absolutely correct. I have so many investigators in transplant area that want to use the facility. I think they're going to absorb any amount of capacity that we deliver. So I'm not sure yet. And, and that certainly is, is my answer as well. I, I think we have enough patients, enough diseases, and uh, enough bandwidth. Uh, and we're going to expand our bandwidth. Part of the sure. programs we're going to do is to bring in new scientists working yes. here. Definitely. So uh, our HM patients are really going to be the real beneficiaries of the Johnson's philanthropy. Uh, how many different cell therapy projects will the Johnson Lab be able to do at one time or in one year? Do we need to get Mr. Jones back in here for <laughs> I that? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jenny, what? I can think of five from day one. So I come up with, that all depends on Mr. Jones, whether we <laughs> increases, but there are five cancer projects that can go off immediately. So. <laughs> Uh, that's a great question, and you may find us fighting over that question <laughs> within, within the next period of time, unless the mis Mr. Jones' largesse expands beyond <laughs> where we thought. Uh, Osamu, any thoughts? Well, I, th I, think, I think, like you all said, there's going to be, of course, competition for the resource, and there's going to yeah. be a lot of patience. And the luckily, I think, Stan, you, come up, you came up with a really good design yeah. of having a steering committee. and. We're going to base it on the best science, moves forward faster, and that's, I think, what we're going to do. Yeah, I, uh, let, me, let me just reinforce what Osamo said. Uh, our programs, our cell therapy programs, has a steering committee, and the steering committee consists of my two colleagues here, as well as Pat McCulloch uh, and John Cook, Pat McCulloch from orthopedics and John Cook from cancer, as well as myself. And what we've all decided is that it is our goal not just to run our own programs, but to make sure we have quality control for the whole institution with regard to cell therapy, that we vet the best programs going on, and even if they're not in our own area, that we have an opportunity to bring other scientists to benefit from our cell therapy facility and program. And, and that certainly is our goal, and, and we're committed to it, and I think all of us are committed yeah. to this sort of program. Uh, you, any plans for expansion? Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, Ed Jones, he, there he is sitting. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me just tell you uh, that the facility as it exists right now is one of the most luxurious, large, well-equipped facility that one could have already. And I think before we go on to discuss expansion, let's yeah. make sure we're using this effectively, yes. that we're doing the kind of transformative science and cell therapy for our patients and are benefiting patients and our leading medicine. And that, that's really our goal here, and we're going to accomplish this. Uh, we briefly touched on orthopedics. Do you know what disease or injury cell therapy can help with in orthopedics? Well, Dr. McCulloch is not with us right now, but I know from discussions that we have had, uh, joint repair yeah. is critical. Joint repair, whether it's arthritis, whether it's from traumatic injury, what have you. Because as Dr. Gaber was saying, one of the things you can do is you can take cells, you can grow them in the laboratory, and you can begin to get these cells to differentiate into cartilage, mm -hmm. into other 
uh, parts of the joint that need repair. So I think it's a very exciting way that we're going to be going for orthopedics as well. The next, uh, are there any trials utilizing stem cells for patients requiring kidney transplants? If so, what are the results of the trial? Uh, Osama, uh, what are your well, we, thoughts? Because I think you, you've begun <laughs> to focus on that as well. We have. We have, we have, a, we have a trial that's FDA approved. And I think it's the only one that's FDA approved for kidney patients in the country where at the time of kidney transplantation, they're getting uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Okay. And we already have like two groups of patients enrolled in a trial. The trial, the stem cells appear to be very safe. We're you know, now running the immunological assays and markers. We see some very encouraging things. Of course, as you know, science is an iterative process. It takes a long time to get the trial, but I think I'm very encouraged by that. We just had an international meeting with some of the international colleagues working on that. The results are really, really good. We think that immune modulation is a uh, is a true phenomenon with these stem cells, yeah. and will lead to some no, I effect. Think I think that's fabulous. Good. Here's another question that I know you're already working on with regard to the pancreas. Can stem cells be used to generate new artificial organs? Well, I mean, like Stan said, we are we are working on a way to get stem cells to uh, produce insulin so that we can use them as a replacement for pancreas. But also, as since we all have been beating on Mr. Jones, I want to say he supported us in uh, recruiting this new scientist that's coming in. And her passion is really, or her joy, has been trying to create an artificial, not an artificial, but a, a bio-artificial lung. So basically take stem cells and make it into a lung. And her goal is within the next three to five years to really make a human lung that we would use in transplantation uh, from the stem cells. So this is very, very exciting. And it really fits in with having the gift from the Johnsons. And it's really the platform that's going to allow her to do what she can do for us. So yes, and it's, it's very exciting. Very. Uh, the next, uh, how will the Johnson Lab make Houston Methodist stand apart against other top U.S. hospitals? Jenny, you want to? Well, there are very few uh, U.S. hospitals that actually can do this. Uh, they, they need to be fact accredited. For, for cancer, cell-based therapies can still be toxic, so we need a lot of accreditation, a lot of things that um, can go wrong, like cytokine release syndrome. You have uh, ex many, many things that can go wrong. So. In, uh, there are only a few places in the U.S. that can actually do these things, so we're going to be one of them. We can, at the moment, we do do it uh, together in collaboration with uh, our colleagues across the street uh, at Baylor College of Medicine, but we can actually start doing it in-house. We have also another vision to be able maybe even to take this into our community in the future, that we can somehow manage to expand um, the, the, the footprint of how we can do cell-based therapies, not just at main campus, but elsewhere. No, I think that's extremely important. I'll point out from my personal experience, I'll not name the other institutions that in fact we're collaborating with that do not have their own facility, GMP facility, and need to go across town yeah. to collaborate in my home city of Boston. <laughs> so, home city of Houston, but uh, formerly home city of Boston. Uh, the next question is, is stem cell therapy different from gene therapy or the same? Uh, let me just try the answer to that. Uh, gene therapy uh, has reached uh, a state of early maturity now in our field. For example, uh, in motor neuron diseases, SMA, uh, you can shut off a gene with a technology called antisense oligonucleotide. And when you've done that, the patients, the young kids are now living. You can also put in a new gene with a viral vector, and that also is working in spinal muscular atrophy. Game changing, kids are living incredible. That's gene therapy. Stem cell therapy is very different. It can do a number of things. It can be used to alter the immune system, as we've heard. It can be used to change cells in a way that they can attack cancer, as we've heard. And also, it can be used to grow organs, as we've heard. So it has a greater, greater purview than gene therapy does, although gene therapy 
when you want to target a single gene mm -hmm. is an effective way to go. So both are extremely useful and we're at the top of our game now at Houston Methodist with both. How will creating organs be ethically monitored? That's yours, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> that is a very complex question. Um, I think that because of the fact that you can take stem cells, hopefully you can do it from the patient's own stem cells, then the ethical questions would be not very severe or serious because the patient is donating the cells that are now put to make them the organ. Of course, that's not going to work for old patients because probably some of the diseases would affect the cells that come out of the patients so we would need to take cells from other patients. And because there has been an a long history of cellular therapy in the country. There are some guidelines, but of course we would need to work harder on more. It's a very difficult question because the ethics get so complex, of course. But I think at Houston Methodist, we always really stay in the most conservative and most ethical approach to doing this. And that's the intention of, of our program. Great, thank you. Well, I see no more questions there. Dr. Boom. Uh, would you like to ask anything or have any thoughts you'd like to offer us? Well, what other fields do you see that might be added into this? You've described a number of priority areas, but um, there are other fields as we continue to expand this going forward. So talk a little bit about that. Well, one of the fields that uh, we had contemplated including uh, asked uh, if they could uh, take a little rain check for several months is the field of gastroenterology, which I think is extremely important. And uh, Dr. Quigley and his group will be joining us in due time. Uh, there are a number of other fields that I think uh, will be productive. I know uh, our colleagues in urology have talked about the importance of stem cells and GMP <laughs> facility. Uh, that would be important there. That's, that's and. Awesome. Uh, I, I think uh, I've not emphasized cerebrovascular disease at all in stroke, mm -hmm. but what is quite clear is there are a number of ways that we can use our GMP facility to benefit our patients with ischemic stroke, and we're excited about that as well. I think also heart failure, uh, the progression of heart disease into heart failure has an immunological component and a fibrosis component and both can be tackled by stem cells. And we have Dr. Bimaraj and uh, his group, Dr. Uh, they're, uh, they're working on that. So I, I think they can be easily interested in this technology and want to and wanna participate in that sort of research. No, I, I agree totally. I think, uh, question, what is the actual process of removing and then replacing cells in a patient question surgery? I would just start by saying, in ours, it's very simple. Uh, we take the blood out, yes. <laughs> we isolate the cells, we expand yes. certain populations, and then we put them back into the same patient, right. and that's called autologous. But the holy grail here is, in fact, to take and do the same process in normal people, take out their cells, and then give it to patients who need it, and that's called allogeneic as opposed to autologous. And the reason why that's the holy grail is because you can then have an off-the-shelf therapy yeah. for varying diseases where you don't have to take it from the same patient and give it back. So that is uh, where we're all heading. That is certainly the future, and we'll be here very, very, very soon. Very shortly. Very yeah, soon. very and shortly. It's the same for cancer, so yeah. we're exactly the same too. Right. Uh, Elizabeth, is this the time where we turn things back to you, or? I, I guess so. You've answered all the questions, so um, that was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Appel and Dr. Gaber and Dr. Chang for this inspiring discussion. As part of the Johnson's uh, commitment to establish the Johnson Center for Cellular Therapeutics, they helped provide a $4 million challenge fund to match all gifts, dollar for dollar, for each center of excellence that we've mentioned today, as well as for the Houston Methodist Academic Institute. When completed, this initiative will create an $8 million fund to support the translational research 
housed at the Johnson Center, which will directly benefit the projects you heard about this morning and more. While all gifts will be matched, donors of $50,000 or more will be founding members of the Ann Kimball and John W. Johnson Center for Cellular Therapeutics. Founding members will be the first to learn of exciting new research and discoveries, and they will have the opportunity to engage in conversations with the scientists and researchers behind these amazing projects. Gifts can be funded over a period of five years. If you would like more information about supporting the Center for Cellular Therapeutics, please reach out to Susan Coulter at the Foundation. We would really appreciate your feedback on what you heard today and we are available to follow up at a later date. With that, thank you very much for participating in this morning's roundtable, and we wish you all continued good health and God's blessing.